Glass-Steagall Act effectively separated commercial banking from investment banking and created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC, among other things. It was one of the most widely debated legislative initiatives before being signed into law by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in June of 1933. In the Roaring 20s, the stock market was booming. Everyone was investing a vast majority of their net worth into the stock market, many not even knowing exactly what they were buying, and, more importantly, many were borrowing money from the banks to buy the stocks to begin with. As stock prices went up 400%, this quickly caused the market to become overpriced and overevaluated, and investors pulled out the vast majority of their money in just a couple of days, causing the market to crash and wiping out the life savings of the majority of Americans. Tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in market prices. Businesses went under, jobs disappeared, and America entered what we now call the Great Depression. Now this is a very simplistic overview of the famous market crash, but in the wake of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law one of the most widely debated pieces of legislation, the Glass-Steagall Act. The main provisions of the Banking Act of 1933 separated commercial banking from investment banking. Senator Glass was the driving force behind this provision. Basically, commercial banks, which took in deposits from everyday customers and made loans, were no longer allowed to deal in securities, meaning making investments, while investment banks which underwrote and dealt in securities, were no longer allowed to have close connections to commercial banks, such as overlapping directorships or common ownership. Even with the passing of the Banking Act, it would take several years in the vast expansion of the federal government and government spending to get the country back on its feet. And in less than 10 years, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and America was finally entered into World War II. In 1944, the US dollar became the world's foremost reserve currency by the signing of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was signed by delegates from 44 countries where they created an efficient foreign exchange system, preventing competitive devaluations of individual currencies and promoting international economic growth. In the 1950s, as GIs returned home and we created the suburbs and what we now call the American dream took root, America's GDP grew by 37% and unemployment remained low at around 4.5%. By the end of the decade, American families had 30% more purchasing power and as TVs and movies became more and more popular, commercialism took hold and America started its great addiction as consumers. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. Whoa, whoa, I know we're in the middle of a video, but I have breaking, important news. I'm close to 1,000 subscribers. And when I hit that, I'm going to do something and give something back to the amazing community I'm proud to be a part of. You want this? I need 1,000 subscribers. Help me get there and I'm going to do a major giveaway with this and more. This piece of silver, this beautiful, shiny, heavy piece of silver could be yours. So when I hit 1,000 subs, I'm giving this bad boy away. All right, back to the show. In the late 1970s, inflation soared as we left the gold standard and the Keynesian economic policy, whose central tenet is that government intervention can stabilize the economy. In response to the high inflation, rise in crime, a new leader emerged to the scene who promised that it was morning in America again. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. Ronald Reagan, the great communicator, who wanted to deregulate the market so Wall Street could do what Wall Street does best, 
believed that if investors were allowed to make as much money as possible with little to no government interference, the profits would trickle down to the common, everyday, middle, and lower class Americans. This proved to be inaccurate. But surprisingly, it wasn't Reagan who ended the Glass-Steagall Act. It was Democratic President Bill Clinton who finally brought the long-standing Banking Act to rest. The Glass-Steagall Act was repealed in 1999 amid long-standing concerns that the limitations it imposed on the banking sector were unhealthy and that allowing banks to diversify would reduce risk. Starting in 1999, commercial banks could use the deposits of any and all customers to invest how they see fit. In 10 years, America would face the worst market crash since 1929, as many banks, most of whom were deemed too big to fail, were caught with massive ledgers of bad investments through subprime mortgages, meaning mortgages given to individuals with low credit ratings that could not afford to pay back the loan. For Wall Street, it was another case of whiplash. The markets haven't been this volatile in almost 80 years. In 2008, 26 banks failed. In 2009, another 140 banks would join them. In 2010, another 150 banks collapsed. In 2008, around $245 billion of taxpayer money was used to stabilize more than 700 banks, including Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. Of the nine early recipients of the taxpayer bailout money, more than 4,500 employees were paid at least $1 million in bonuses by their employer. Should we bring back the Banking Act and separate commercial banking from investment banking? Reinstating Glass-Steagall would better protect depositors. At the same time, it would disrupt the bank structures and banks would no longer be too big to fail. And it could slow economic growth as they reorganize. But isn't a temporarily slow economy, much like we're facing in 2023 and 2024, a low price to pay to prevent the reoccurring collapse of banks who continuously need to get bailed out either through taxpayer money or through a fund that banks pay into using customers' deposits, which can be argued is the same as taxpayer money? What do you think? Leave a comment down below and tell me if you think that we should reinstate the Glass-Steagall Banking Act. Hi, I'm Trader Bubba. Today, we're talking about prepper stacking. Hi, hey, welcome to Trader Bubba's. You may be wondering why there's two of us here. Amazon stock split. Amazon stock split. I don't want to hear about Amazon. Talk about Tesla. What's the right tip? Does your wife pester you for a dog and you made the mistake of making a joke about already having a bitch in the house? It's hard not to trust an overweight white guy with a crap ton of swords. But maybe you should be trusting an overweight white guy with a gun. Let's look at the gold and silver spot price, but first, a quick word from our sponsor. It's me. I'm the sponsor. <laughs>